Welcome to the Productivity Show, a podcast where we believe that you can get the important things done without having to sacrifice your health, family, and things that matter to you. In today's episode, we'll catch you up on what's been happening in our industry and new trends that you need to be aware of so you stay ahead of the curve. And if it's your first time listening, welcome. Thank you for listening and tuning in. I just want to give you a quick background on the two of us here. My name is Tan. I'm the founder and CEO of Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Brooks Duncan, the COO of Asian Efficiency. And we both we basically both came from productivity from completely different backgrounds and directions. I started the company back in 2011 as really as a passion project. It was actually never meant to be a business. It was meant to share what I was learning about productivity, about time management, about goal setting, personal growth. And it just accidentally turned into a business where we are now today as one of the top productivity companies in the world and the number one productivity podcast in the world. Yeah. And I worked in corporates and in startups. So I've worked in local software companies. Uh, I've worked in companies as small as three people. Also worked in large companies, you know, 55,000 people international. So I've learned all the productivity tricks you need to deal with scaling, that type of thing, and the type of emails and information you need to do- work with when you have a few, a small team is very different than when you have colleagues all around the world. Both kind of seen and done it all. And I know we started this podcast to help people more. We started this podcast to be, <laughs> we started this podcast to help people become more productive at work and in life. And Tan, I know you always say that happy people are productive people. And that's what we want to do with this podcast. We want to share tips. We want to share strategies. We really want to help you win back time, have more energy and get focused on what matters. Sometimes we have guests, sometimes it's the two of us, and sometimes there's just one of us, but we always want to give you actionable productivity tips and insights. And we love getting reviews and feedback from listeners. For example, we had a review recently from this user named Super Gurk, and this person said, this is my favorite weekly podcast on productivity because I listen to it consistently and put it into action. The co-host setup is relaxed, conversational, very friendly, and super useful. The occasional guests they bring are top-notch, and everyone genuinely wants to help you. Check out their subscription program and online courses. These guys show up. Thank you for sharing that, Super Greg. And yeah, we always want to make sure that everyone listening can get something from every single episode. We know it's like an investment in time for yourself, for your ongoing education. And if you can listen to us for 30 to 45 minutes, you can at least expect doubling that, getting that back in time and productivity. So if you want to get in touch with us, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can also email us at support or podcast at asianefficiency.com. Brooks, we're going to be covering a lot here today, and we have three important topics to go over. One is there's a lot of new email apps that are out there that are revolutionary and gimmicky, but are they actually worth your time and money? That's something we're going to be going over today. Also, there's this trend of telling companies and teams that they should go asynchronously. And I'm not quite sure if I agree with that, but we're going to be diving deeper into that a little later as well. And then also, is hiring a coach worth it? How do you find the right coach, whether it's for fitness, for finance, for other things in your life? Is it worthwhile spending your money hiring a coach? We're going to be going over that as well. But as always, we always like to kick it off with our top three favorite resources. And Brooks, I know you've been traveling and been out and about, so you've picked up a lot of new cool stuff. So what do you want to share with us today? Yeah, so I just finished a trip where I was gone for 11 days. I stayed in five hotels in that 11 days and in three different countries. And so some things that worked really well for me, number one, Eralo regional sims. Now we've talked about air allo before, and we're going to have a link to all of these things in the show notes, the productivity show.com. And so we've talked about air allo, which basically is a way to get eSIM. So when you're traveling, you don't have to do the old thing. Uh, And especially with the new iPhones, you can't do the old thing where you have to go and like line up somewhere and buy a SIM. So air allo sells you eSIMs. But what I thought you'd have to do is every country you go to is buy a new SIM for that country. But what I learned is they actually have something called a regional SIM. So if you're going to an area of the world, in my case, Europe, you just need to buy like a European SIM and it works in all of the different countries. And there's regional SIMs all over the world for that. So it just makes traveling so much easier, way easier, way easier than I even thought. That's number one. Number two is 
the microphone I take when I travel. So this is actually a workation more than a vacation. So I was working while I was traveling and that, that involved recording some stuff for the podcast and some other stuff. And so I took a microphone with me and the microphone I took with me is the Audio-Technica AT2005 USB. And it's a USB microphone, but it also has an XLR connection. So if you care about that thing, it can do both, which makes it really flexible and also has really good sound quality. And it comes in this small little bag. So I just threw it in my backpack and just carried it with me throughout the whole trip. It worked out really well. I was happy with it. And third is, you may not know that we actually have a new YouTube channel sharing just clips from the productivity show. So far, we've been doing clips from our most recent episodes, but we're going to be going back into the archives and making clips from some of our older episodes as well. So we'll have a link to that, the productivity show clips channel in the show notes as well. So you can get access to all of those three things in the productivity show.com or just swipe in your email app and they'll be listed there. Awesome. Thanks, Brooks, for sharing that. And uh, what are we up to nowadays? I know there's a lot of stuff happening. There's a lot of newsworthy updates. We have the Kindle Scry. We have the Matter stuff. We have the Gatorade Smart Bottle. Like, where do you want to start? Yeah. So like Tan said, we have some topics we want to discuss, but what we like to do at the start of these episodes is just share some things that are going on. So number one is Amazon has announced a new Kindle. And it's actually, if you think about it, the first like really new format Kindle in quite a while. They've been riding that paper white <laughs> for quite some time and the Oasis as well. But it's called the Kindle Strat but it's called the Kindle Scribe. And so it's an e-ink tablet. And what it's meant for is reading and writing. So we've all read on Kindles for years and years, but what the Kindle Scribe does is it comes with a pen and it allows you to just like scribble on, take marks, take notes, write on Kindle books, can also mark up PDFs, but it has that really readable, really lightweight e-ink ink screen that the Kindle is famous for. So some people might have their like alarms going up saying, hey, it, this seems like the Remarkable 2, which we've talked about on the podcast quite a bit. And yeah, I would say this really is a competitor to that. It's a similar type of device. What Amazon says is the battery is going to last for 12 weeks, which is pretty amazing. And the Kindle has a backlight and they say has higher resolution. I haven't tried it myself. I know there's a lot of remarkable fans in the Productivity Show listenership and in our Productivity Academy community. So it's really going to be interesting once it launches to see what it's like. So that's number one, the Kindle Scribe. Number two is there's a new home automation spec that's finalized and it's been talked about for quite some time. I've had it on my list to talk about on the podcast for a while. I'm finally going to do it today because it's been finalized. And it's a little confusing because we've talked about Matter before, which is a reader app that I like, but this is something completely different. This is a specification for smart home devices. So the problem with smart home devices is... They don't really work that well together. So Apple has theirs, Amazon has theirs, Philips has their Hue. And yeah, you can bridge them kind of with HomeKit and a lot of them work with Amazon solution, but there hasn't really been a good specification to make them all work together. And I was actually very surprised that the companies were able to get together and do this, but it's really happening. So we'll have a link in the show notes to find out more about that. But yeah, Google, Apple actually surprised me. Usually they like doing their own thing, but Google, Apple, Samsung, Amazon, Philips, like a whole bunch of different manufacturers are participating and it's really going to make home automation a lot easier and stop you from having to have a million hubs all over the place. So that's the second thing. The matter specification is finally launched. And number three is Gatorade has released a smart water bottle that tells you when it's time to hydrate. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm generally pretty aware when I'm thirsty and we've actually talked about smart water bottles on the past. In fact, Tan, you sent me one called the Hydrate Smart Spark before. I know you used to use it. It's really cool cool. And smart water bottles actually are kind of helpful because they encourage you to drink more water. This is something a lot of us can really benefit from. Gatorade is kind of taking it to the next level. It's called the Smart GX water bottle system. And what that has is LEDs that kind of show you your progress towards whatever your hydration goals are, but also you, it has a patch you can wear that tracks your perspiration. And then the connected app will tell you when you need to hydrate. So Probably for us mere mortals, maybe this is a little overkill unless you're really into smart devices. But for athletes, I could see it really big. How about you, Tan? Are you going to be you're going to be getting a Gatorade water bottle or getting some new home automation tools? 
Well, I thought the water bottle thing is interesting. And when I think about the perfect market for this, it would be probably a professional athlete or someone who's trying to go pro. And I think most of us are maybe not at that level. Also, having used smart water bottles in the past, I found them to be too gimmicky for me personally. So I kind of stopped using them. What I found working for me is if I buy one of those big jugs, you can buy them on Amazon for $10, $15. They're like, roughly two and a half liters and they will actually indicate like how much water is in there. And all I do is every morning I just fill up the jug and then my goal is just to finish it by the end of the day. So if I know that I'm finishing this jug before the end of the day, then I have my water intake and that's really simple, really analog, but it works. And so I'm not too concerned about like the timing aspect of it, as long as I make it a, a I would say daily habit for, and I would say daily five, six times of the week. I think that's pretty good. As far as like the whole matter specification, I think this was just a matter of time as well, pun intended. And when it comes to all these devices, if, you know, like you said, Philips Hue, Amazon, Google, Apple, but none of these really work together. So it makes sense to have some sort of spec that allows them to all work together. And we as a consumer get the benefit from this because how many of us have like a Windows computer, you know, a Samsung device, and then an Apple device as well. And somehow they can sort of work together because of the internet in some ways. But if you have home devices, they don't work together at all. It's kind of the option of you go into one ecosystem or you don't altogether. And so, for example, I have, you know, an Amazon device at home. I have the Philips Hue lights at home. I have some smart Apple devices at home as well. So, like, I would love for all of them to really seamlessly work together. And I think over time, when that matter spec specification does come out, I think it will be interesting to be able to automate some stuff and have them all work together and then turn our smart home even smarter. And then as far as like the scribe, I'm actually very interested in seeing how this performs. Generally, I think Amazon has done a great job of releasing products. When I look at most of their products, most of them have been a pretty big hit. And the ones that kind of were failures, you don't even know anymore. Do you remember the Fire Phone? That was even a thing for a little bit, but nobody has the Fire Phone <laughs> nowadays. So they're definitely learning and adopting. So I'll be curious to see how the scribe device works because I think the e-ink uh, screen is really revolutionary and I personally like it, but being able to use it to highlight stuff, you know, using a pen, I think that will be for me personally, very interesting just because I don't have a remarkable to myself. And I know a lot of friends who have it and rave about it, but I just never see the purpose of it for myself. And yeah, if time permits and budget permits, maybe we'll get there or Amazon, if you're listening, feel free to hook us up both the books and myself. You just never know. Thank you. Thank you for including me in that pitch. I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right, let's go over some of the industry happenings, some of the topics we want to talk about today. And I will start off with the first one. And it's basically related to email apps. And I've noticed, and we've talked about it a little bit on the podcast before, but I've noticed that there's this kind of like new class of email apps that are coming out more and more. Some of them have been around for a while. Some of them have just been released. And basically the general idea is we all know that email is a struggle for all of us. So the idea behind these email apps is, hey, we have, and they all say this, you know, we have a better way to do email. And what really prompted this, for me anyway, is the email app that I use called Spark by re just released a new version of their email app called Spark 3. And it's been pretty controversial because I've been traveling. Like I said, I haven't actually looked at it as of recording this. I'm going to take a look at it soon. But basically, the general idea is they're rethinking email. <laughs> and so the good news is there's a new Windows version. So it's always been a Mac and Android and iOS app. But now they have a Windows desktop version, but what they've done is they've introduced, and it's always been free, but what they've done is they've introduced a new premium tier that has a bunch of different features all built in. So first of all, what it will do is when you receive an email and you've never had an email from that person before, it'll ask you, hey, do you want to allow this or block it? So right away you have control, they say, over who emails you in. Uh, what it'll let you do is treat emails as tasks. So you can mark them as done. You can set their priority. And what it does is it actually moves it up and down your inbox. So it really does allow you, the gen they say, to use your email as an inbox, which is something we always say you shouldn't do, but they're leaning into what people actually do. You can snooze emails. That's a pretty standard feature these days. And it has a momentum like home screen where they're basically what they do is they're trying, in a way, they're kind of trying to hide your email inbox to 
reduce the struggle so many of us have, which is just being in your inbox, checking it all the time, having it front and center. What they kind of do is try to only surface the important ones and make you work to see the other ones. It also has an Alfred-like interface to let you control things by, by keyboard. And some people predictably love these new features. Some people really hate it. There's been a lot of social media chatter about the new Spark. And I think they must be getting some blowback because I just saw today, just before recording, they sent out an email to existing users trying to explain their thinking and apologizing for not educating people more. But it really made me think of how there's all these attempts to rethink email. There was Google Inbox back in the day. There's Superhuman, which I know you've used in the past 10. There's Hey by the makers of Basecamp. And I guess the question I have for you, I'm curious your thoughts of this is, are these new email apps, you know, rethinking email, is that something that app makers should be trying to do? Is this a, is this solving an actual problem or would a better thing do, or would a better thing be is to just all improve our habits and try to have good email skills right from the get-go rather than trying to use these email apps as a band-aid to fix our bad bad habits. What do you think about all this? When it comes to making change, I think it's much easier to make changes on the tech level rather than changing people's behavior. Changing the way email is presented to you, the way it's being, being, being quote unquote delivered to you will be much easier to change than trying to change the habits of like millions of people. So I think on the tech level, it makes a lot of sense to try to fix email that way. However, because when you think about email, it's been relatively new. It's maybe been around for 25, 30 years or so. So it's not like brand new, but it's also relatively like new in the sense that, you know, most of our parents probably didn't use this at all. Right. So there's no education around this either. When it comes to like in school, you don't learn about how to think about email, how to use it. Like if you get your first corporate job, everyone just assumes you kind of know how to use email and use it efficiently. And, you know, lo and behold, that turns out to be a disaster for most people. Hence why we have a lot of courses around email. So I think changing people's behavior is the more challenging aspect. So making changes on a tech level makes a lot of sense. And I remember when, hey, launched uh, maybe two, three years ago, it was supposed to change the game. And it was a lot of hype. And, you know, you had to sign up to be on the wait list. You have to be early, you know, and if you were early, then you were very fortunate enough to get in. And then they would promise all these things. But when was the last time you heard about, hey, I don't remember hearing about this at all. And I remember signing up for it thinking, oh, this looks really impressive. And I think the intention is good to change email because I think it does have a lot of room for improvements. But I think Google Inbox has done a really good job for most of us. For example, one feature that I like is if you're subscribed to an email newsletter and you haven't really opened the email in a while, it will then give you a prompt at the top of your inbox to say, hey, it seems like you haven't checked out this newsletter in a while. Do you still want to subscribe to it? And if not, click this button and we'll automatically unsubscribe for you. And like stuff like that makes rethinking and redoing email a lot better, in my opinion. And because it's web-based as well, it's gives people a lot of leverage to, you know, deploy code and make it usable right away without you know, having people to upgrade their software on their computer and people might be running on different versions and so on. I'm a big fan of the Google Inbox updates. And now that I've used it for so many years, I don't even think about it as Google Inbox. I just think of as Google Mail, <laughs> essentially. And I've tried Superhuman, but it's just, even as somebody who is a hardcore productivity nerd, the command line interface makes sense to some people, but for me, it just never clicked. Even though I know the shortcuts, you know, command K and kind of go from there. I just feel like it was just more tyranny rather than being actually intentional about your email. I found that never to be working for me. So I tried it for three, four months and just kind of stopped using it altogether. Another thing I wonder is if there's ever going to be a paid email service or email app that really sticks because you know, a lot of people thought when Fantastical came out, for example, and it was a subscription, a lot of people thought, or, and even when it was one-time purchase, you know, are people actually going to pay for a, for a calendar app when we all have one for free? And I wonder if, you know, where there's, hey, there's Superhuman, now there's this Spark Premium, if we're ever going to have a, any paid email app that gains momentum. Because email is so funny because it's somebody, some, 
Email is so funny because it's something that everybody, almost everybody struggles with, but no one's really cracked a way to help people do it on a technology level. I think you're right. Maybe Google's, what they're doing through their existing platform is probably the most successful, but I'm not sure anyone would actually pay for it. So it'd be interesting. All right. So that is topic number one about email apps. And I'm curious actually to your thoughts, though, if you're listening to this, have you had success with one of these email apps? You can just hit us up on social media at Asian Efficiency on Instagram, on Twitter, or you can just email us podcast at asianefficiency.com. Curious your thoughts on email apps, Uh, but we're going to move in a totally different direction. I'm going to take the second topic as well. And this is a question that I'm Really curious of your thoughts on Tam, because you've, one thing I would say with Asian efficiency is you've really crafted it to work a certain way. And it's kind of similar to what we're going to talk about, but there are some big differences. And this is the question is, can teams or should teams or even whole companies go async first is the buzzword. And I'm going to use some buzzwords, but I'll try to explain it here. And What prompted this was this infographic I came across from Marissa Goldberg, who runs a site called Remote Work Prep, and I'll link to the infographic in the the show notes. But basically what the infographic does is it shows, and I don't know if she created it or she was just sharing it, I kind of looked into it, but it shows the work schedules of of a bunch of different quote unquote geniuses throughout history. So Benjamin Franklin, Mozart, Maya Angelou, Ruki Murakami, my favorite author. And what it does is it breaks down their schedule by sleepy times, kind of day job admin times that they have day job, food and leisure, exercise, creative work. And really what it showed is that, spoiler alert, people generally have, even if people who do similar things generally have different times where they work the best. And this isn't any big surprise, but it really showed in that infographic, it really did show the differences. And her point, and she did a whole Twitter thread on this, which I'll also share, is that your team or your company might not be doing its best work and getting its best result out of its people if you're kind of forcing everybody into working the same eight hours, even working at the same time. So what she recommends is having your team go async first, async short for asynchronous. And basically it means that setting things up so that people really don't have to be working at the same time, you know, and have your systems, your tools, your technologies kind of supporting people so that instead of saying, having to be in meetings all the time at the same time, you could maybe post messages in Slack. And even if people are working at different times, you know, the work kind of continues. And that might mean cutting back on meetings or even getting rid of real-time meetings altogether. Might mean setting up special Slack channels or Teams channels, communicating by comments or messages versus pinging people with direct messages and expecting an immediate response. And kind of like similar to this, the CEO of Doist, who makes to Doist. So we got a product, another productivity angle here, he just posted this, a similar thing. He shared some keys to being async first. And what he says to make sure is that async first doesn't mean async only. So he wanted to highlight, there's a lot of value to things like team meetup, one-on-ones are really important and that type of thing. And working in Europe the last couple of weeks versus the Pacific time that I'm usually working from has really highlighted this because I've been definitely asynchronous from the rest of the team for a lot of the last couple of weeks. And so I'm curious, Tan, I wouldn't say AE is async, certainly not async only because we have meetings. I guess you could say we're async first somewhat, but I'm curious to your thoughts on this. Is there value for having people working at least some of the time at the same time, or can you get away with people working completely different times? Well, when I first saw this tweet, I immediately thought, okay, how can you automatically disprove this idea? So (laughs) someone's making a strong opinion about, Hey, you know, we should go async first. And my first thought was, I like the idea, but it's just unrealistic because it only applies to very specific teams or very specific companies. So for example, I would never want my surgeon to be in his hospital or clinic. Just like my personal trainer, I want to 
meet with him synchronously. Like we're in the same place working together, not async. It's somewhat limited to remote companies, right? That's the first thing. And again, you can only convey so much information in the tweet, obviously. So totally get that. But I think that's the first thing to put some context around is this does not apply to everybody. This really applies more for people who have some sort of remote setting or so. And since we started since 2011, we've always been remote first, first and foremost, like we've never had a physical office space or anything like that. We still meet in person every now and then, but we've never had physical office space where we all gathered and worked together because we're all over the world. So in a way we were a sync initially, but as we start building our team, we kind of realized, hey, if we want to get the best out of our team, we do need a little bit of overlap of when we're working on stuff. For example, when we're not asynchronous and we're overlapping, essentially, it's much easier to go, hey, let's hop on the Zoom. I want to brainstorm this with you. Or, hey, I just created this. Can you have a quick look at this and then get back to me? When you're asynchronous completely, a lot of those back and forth get slowed down quite a bit, which is at the convenience of you can kind of check your own stuff at your own time, but it also slows production because if I have to wait eight hours because you're on the other side of the world, I might be held back right now from finishing this right now. And if you're working in a team setting and you have a sprint, which we typically do, you can get away with that with a few things. But if you're trying to be in a high performance setting, you need a little bit of overlap, in my opinion. We don't have to be overlapping the whole time. But if we have two or three hours of overlap, that would be ideal because we can then have meetings. We can talk about, hey, uh, this critical issue just came up. Like, how do we handle this? Like whenever there's emergencies, it's nice to be able to have other people around you to say, hey, how can we fix this right now instead of having it all rely on one person? So it's really dependent on the group, the team, and the organization. I would say the smaller the company, the easier it is to go async, but the bigger the company becomes, the more you need overlap. So one thing we do every day is have a daily huddle. And this is, you know, usually it's very short. Do you think that you could get away with having a async daily huddle, for example, like the point, the way we use huddles anyway, is the point of getting people together and touching base and clearing roadblocks. Uh, theoretically, and I know there's even software for this, or some people use Slack channels for this or Teams channels. Theoretically, you could post the same thing in an async way, like post, hey, this is what I'm working on. This is where I need help. And then, you know, somebody could pick it up. Do you think that is workable? Or do you think there, obviously it's workable because people do it, but do you think the value of talking about huddle specifically, do you think the value of having a real-time huddle kind of outweighs the, the benefit or do you think you could do it successfully the other way? I would say if we did not have our daily huddle, I don't think we would be as productive as we could be. So yes, I truly believe that the huddle where we overlap makes such a big difference that it's become so important that anybody that we hire moving forwards will have to agree that we have a daily huddle at this time because that's something I'm not willing to cater to and say, hey, regardless of what your situation might be, our huddle time is this time. Can you make that happen? If not, I'm going to put the huddle first over a potential hire. I think it's truly that important because I've just seen so many huddles where we look at the board and go, okay, this needs attention. What happens next? What's the next action? And when three or four people or five or six or seven people are looking at it and say, hey, we need to figure this out or this problem is going to come up. There's so much transfer of knowledge that otherwise wouldn't happen when you're async. Like when we're async and we post on Slack saying, hey, I'm working on this, you know, please have a look at this. I'm stuck. Not everybody will actually look at that first and foremost. But then also too, you might get conflicting feedback and you might also get uh Erroneous feedback as well, where people might say, hey, you should do this. And the other person might say, actually, no, you, sh you should do that because th something changed because of X, Y, and Z, right? So when we have the overlap, there's so much transfer of knowledge and wisdom and communication that it's worth those 10 minutes of being together to alleviate a lot of roadblocks that then free up other people the rest of the day to work asynchronously the rest of the time, right? So if we take a quote unquote 40 hour work week, and we work eight hours a day and we spend 10 minutes 
being overlapping with the work that we do, those 10 minutes are some of the most valuable, productive time that we have in those eight hours compared to not having it whatsoever. One thing I that I found was fascinating though, is not though, but one thing I found was fascinating is the way your day is so different depending on when uh, that particular synchronous meeting is. In our case, the huddle, usually for me, it's at 9 a.m. And so it kind of, not that I'm not doing stuff before it, obviously I am, but that kind of is a kickoff to a lot of things throughout the rest of the day. Whereas when I was in Europe, the huddle was at 5 p.m. And so it was almost the opposite. It was like a kind of like a funnel to, to getting into my shutdown time where it was kind of talking about and working through what I had been doing versus what I'm going to be doing. And it was just definitely a very interesting reframe. I don't know what kind of lessons I'm taking from that, but it's kind of like getting me thinking of ways how that happened. Yeah, it's fascinating. All right. I will give you topic number three, Tan. What did you want to talk about for our third topic? Should you get a coach for pretty much everything you do in life right now? That's the topic I want to kind of go over right now because, spoiler alert, we have a course called 25X Productivity System where we teach people about the 25 skills to master productivity. And one of the things that we teach inside of this online cohort-based course is accountability and how important it is for sustainability of goals and achieving your goals. And it's one of the most important things you can do to accelerate success and overcome a lot of different challenges. And for those of you who are interested, we have workshops coming up where we go from in-person to online and vice versa. So we have an online version of this course. We also have in-person versions. So if you want to go check out an upcoming workshop, you can go to asianefficiency.com slash events. And Uh, There was a recent episode on another podcast where the hosts were talking about what they do to stay healthy and get healthy and how much money they spend on it. And one of the hosts, uh, Sam Parr of My First Million, he was talking about how one of his rules for getting healthy was he always hires a coach. And if there's anything he ever wants to learn, he will always hire a coach right away. And then he gave some examples and he said, you know what, if I want to do this, I would hire a coach. If I'm going to do that, I'm going to hire a coach. So he said that coaching was a huge shortcut for him, even if it's uh, non-health related. So it kind of got us thinking, saying, hey, should we get a coach for everything that we do? Like one of my close friends is very much like this. Whenever he's trying to learn a new skill, instead of reading a bunch of books or going to a workshop or a seminar, he's going to hire a coach to help him one-on-one get up to speed right away. And I think that's an interesting idea. So I implemented this idea maybe first like six, seven years ago. When I just moved to Austin, there's this place called Top Golf, where you can have drinks and food and swing a golf balls for fun. It's kind of like a Dave and Buster's, but with a golf element to it. It's really fun. If you've never been, highly recommend it. They have a few locations across the United States, but it's a great time. And I got, oh man, my swing is terrible. I need to learn how to get better at this swing. So yes, I could go to YouTube. Yes, I could read a book. Yes, I could you know, watch an online course. And these are all things that would be helpful. But what I did was, you know what? I said, instead of me trying to learn by myself and pretend, potentially create a bad habit or create a bad form from start that I might have to unlearn, I'm going to take lessons and get coaching one-on-one to learn to have proper form for my swing right out the gate. So once I have that proper form, everything else I can learn can then be added on top of that, which is like a really strong foundation. And so I thought, okay, does that apply then to everything? And I would say you can, but it's really a budget thing for you. So I do think it's helpful to have coaching as one of your tools to help you learn something. And there's a great book called The First 20 Hours by Josh Kaufman, who also wrote The Personal MBA. And one of the things he found from research and his own experience was the first 20 hours of you learning a skill are the most critical because everything after that can be kind of like diminishing returns almost. And you learn the foundation and the intermediate level for most things in the first 20 hours. And so if you can be intentional about learning the first 20 hours of any particular skill and you can get the best coaching and training, I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know about you, Brooks. First of all, I was not familiar with that book. So that's going on my list because that sounds like an interesting thing. You know, it's really interesting and it's really difficult. It's a difficult mindset to get around 
for those of us who are into like research and you, we talked a few weeks about go about the Colby score and stuff like that. And people who are like high fact finders, you want to learn how to do things yourself. You know, you, you feel like, oh, I can just do it myself. I don't want to, I don't want to spend a bunch of money on this, but it is such a, it is such a short coat. And especially in business, even if you work in corporate, I know people who have different coaches for different things. They have, you know, business coaches for helping them become better at whatever their field is, but also performance coaches. So coaches that kind of help them raise the next level, because that could be two different things. And yeah, there's so many different types of coaches. We always talk about things like, you know, you were saying a golf one, that's a perfect example. And people like trainers and stuff like that, but there's almost anything. There's somebody out there that can, that can teach you how to be better at what you want to do. I'm definitely going to read that 20 hours book. Cause that's, cause that sounds really interesting. Tan, if you are wanting to learn, if you are wanting to find a coach, you're like, yeah, I want to, I want to get better at some specific area. How do you think people should do it? What's the, you know, you've had lots of coaches, you said, how do you usually find coaches? We have this beautiful thing called the internet. So I think that's probably the number one resource for most people. So Googling, doing some research on, you know, reviews of people, whatever you find is probably something you want to pay closely attention to in terms of reviews and credibility, right? So does this person have a podcast? Do they have a YouTube channel? Do they have some sort of social media presence? What are the reviews? Are the reviews actually real? That kind of stuff. And to give you an example, one of my friends, she was a product manager at a firm and she wanted to start working at one of the bigger firms, like the top tech, tech companies in Silicon Valley. And so she found a product manager that was teaching other product managers how to become better product managers, but also interviewing skills to ace the interview process of the big tech companies like Amazon, Google, you know, Facebook and Meta. So there's coaches specifically teaching people how to ace an interview to work at one of those tech companies. Like you can literally find a coach for everything. And she ended up hiring one of those people. And lo and behold, she aced the interview and ended up landing a job at one of the big tech companies because she did a lot of coaching through one of the people that she found. And she just found this person on YouTube who had you know a big following, a big channel. And she said, hey, I want to work one-on-one -on -one with you. And you know, pricing for coaching can range because one of my friends plays beach volleyball and they charge maybe like $25 a lesson, you know, in a group setting, or if you want one-on-one, it may be like $35, $40 an hour, which is, I think, you know, very reasonable. But then you also have coaches who will charge, you know, hundred, 150, sometimes thousand dollars an hour. It just depends on their experience level and credibility. It ranges from all over. I would say personally, anyone that charges between, let's say 50 to $200 an hour, as long as they have some form of credibility and experience, you'll probably get a lot of value from it in terms of, even if you spend maybe one hour with them, you probably will get a great foundation of where to start, where to go, what kind of research that will save you a lot of time. I'm somebody who doesn't necessarily go to coaches right away because I think coaches are more of a long-term investment. So if I know that I want to do something long-term, then I'll look into it. But if it's just, you know, scratching an itch or something I want to get into myself, I'm happy to learn it myself unless I know that this is going to be like a perpetual thing. Like my personal trainer is somebody I heavily researched and I know I'm going to be training for years and years to come, right? Just like my sports psychologist invested in it heavily because I've been working with this person for four or five years now and did a lot of research on that. It just depends for everybody. And again, budget is you know an important aspect, but you can learn any skill and there's probably somebody who's better at it than you and further ahead that can kind of shortcut it. And whether it's learning a language to copywriting, to organizing, to being more productive at work, hint, hints, you know, there's literally a coach for everything. All right. So we'll have a link to that book, the first 20 hours in the show notes at theproductivityshow.com. Tan, where should people start if they want to put some of the stuff into action? What should people do? Yeah, I feel like we've covered so much ground here. So I'm sure there's one topic that stood out to you where you went, oh yeah, this is for me. This is really something that I should take action on. Start writing it down. That's the first thing I would recommend that you do. So whatever that action step you have in your head, write it down right now. Don't try to memorize it write it down, commit to it and start doing it today or tomorrow, or at least this week. The faster we can implement something, the faster we get results and the more likely it will become a habit. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can find links to everything that we talked about in the show notes. Just swipe or go to the productivity show 
www.thinkingdog.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next episode.